Level up your hunting game and join the cause. Help preserve small town Texas hunting culture and become a more successful hunter by learning the best ways to squeeze the most out of your budget and precious time out in the field. Welcome to the Feed Bandit Podcast. Here are your resident bandits, Richard Kitchlow and Jimmy Byrne. Well, howdy, folks, and uh, welcome back to another solo podcast. Corn Bandit coming back at you. Uh, well, first and foremost, want to apologize for the lack of uh, episodes we've had in 2021. Uh, it's uh, it's well, it's, it's been a crazy year, and here we are, only in mid February. So, um, trying to get things back on track here. A lot of good stuff happening in our personal lives. That's uh, that's kind of uh, unfortunately taking effect on our work here, but uh, we're getting back on track now. And uh, it's 2021. It's a it's a, it's been a bear of a year already. So. Uh, we're going to just jump right into it. So um, this is being done, uh, re- recorded rather, just after this this major Texas uh, Arctic blizzard. And not saying that it didn't happen in Oklahoma and Kansas, it did. But I, I think in Texas, is, uh, it, the least was the least prepared for this, even though I think we were all kind of prepared for it. But it's just, a, you know, just kind of helpless in a lot of ways. Um, uh, obviously, the, the human toll... Uh, has been catastrophic, uh, you know, and even more so the the effect on people's homes and livelihoods has just been incredible, but uh, in, in, incredible in a bad way, I, I should mention. So, uh, obviously, uh, hearts and prayers go out to those folks that are affected by this uh, the storm. Uh, it, it's been uh, well, I've, I've been here forty years, uh, and I've never experienced anything like this. So. Um, anyway, we're going to get down the road. We are, we are Texans. We help each other. And you're seeing a lot of that exemplified right now with, with what's going on. So, um, I keep on chugging away, folks. Spring is on the way, but I uh, thought this would be a good time to, to really talk about, to, to kind of rehash some of the things that we've always been talking about, uh, on this show and have for the last, or really the last couple of years. And, and, and really, they're, they they come into effect with a situation such as this. Uh, also, going to offer up some some tips and some thoughts. Uh, you know, that I've kind of been uh, collecting as uh, as we watch this 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 story unfold. Um, obviously, again, uh, this this Arctic storm came down to uh, to Texas and just kind of whooped our butt. Let's just let's be really honest. And you know, it seems like the further south it went. Uh, it became more um, became more ice than than snow, and um, it, it it really took its toll on on the animals. Uh, in particular, the exotic game that that so freely roams the uh, the hill country in South Texas uh, areas re- really took the biggest hit, um, and that is uh, that's just a real shame. Obviously, uh, nobody wants to see any animal freeze to death. I don't care how much you hate it. Uh, but 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 also it's it's people's livelihoods. You know we're, we're starting to hear stories of uh, you know ranches that offer exotic animal hunts such as black bug, axis, nail guy, uh, where they're they're looking at scenarios of total losses. You know we're we're hearing oh I lost uh, two hundred black buck or I lost you know two hundred axis and. And, and a lot of that, um, there's a couple of factors, but a lot of it, I, I think, has to do with the fact that they've got uh, they've got shorter fur, um, you know, thinner fur, as they say. And uh, you know, the axis deer and the uh, black buck antelope hail from India, and so obviously over in India, you don't get a lot of snowstorms. At least I think where these animals are, I, I don't know India. They have mountains and all that kind of stuff, but. Um, at least where these animals come from, they don't. That said, you know, a lot of these, um, you know, these um, these animals that have been used to stock these ranches have been in Texas for for a long time. You know, starting really probably going back, you could trace their lineage, uh, going back to the twenties when the Wyo Ranch brought them over from their uh, from their native homes. Um, yeah, where it's 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 kind of ironic they're they're struggling over in India, and we actually ship exotic animals back to them. So, um, but but yes, the uh, the the loss of exotic game has been catastrophic. And again, we our our thoughts and prayers go out to a lot of these, um, a lot of these ranches. So, um, this is this is this may be a little premature, but it seems like some of the the ranches that are a little further north. Uh, seem to have fared a little bit better. 
Um, I don't know if that is because the exotics that they have are maybe more used to this, uh, to, to this type of cold, uh, maybe they're from a different bloodline, you know, that's, that was bred maybe up in uh, central Texas, as opposed to deep South Texas, that's, that's, or, or the hill country. That's something that I've always really been thinking a lot of, you know, if, if I, if I'm a rancher and I want to stock my property with black buck antelope, you know, do you go get them in the hill country? And you, when you bring them up here, say to um, uh, to, to Wichita Falls or into Erath County, Texas. Okay, so a little bit further north. You know, are it obviously gets a little cooler up north than it does down south. So, is that going to affect them? You know, would would a better decision be to buy them from a exotic rancher whose stock has been here in the, the north to central Texas. Uh, so uh, that's something that I've been thinking about um, a lot since this thing is whole played out because it seems like a lot of the uh, the mass die-offs, uh, unfortunately, have happened in south Texas and in the, the hill country. So uh, just just something I've been I've been kind of pondering. Uh, you're probably wondering how did Rancho Bandito fare? So uh, we got a lot of snow, uh, definitely got some ice uh, to this day, and this is probably a day or two after kind of the, the real subarctic temperatures. We have only lost one uh, black bug antelope that, that I can figure out um, or that we've at least seen. And I, I kind of take comfort in the fact that a lot of these antelope were hanging out a little bit closer to, uh, to the house uh, that's there, which they traditionally do anyway at night. So... Uh, you know, that, that allowed us to kind of put a finger on, you know, how many we've, uh, how many we've got, are we missing any, you know, and, and so we, we think we may have only lost one. Um, I, you know, the silver lining for, for everybody in, in this type of scenario was that the exotics, you know, they, they, they breed regularly. Okay. They're not like uh, white tails where they, they have a cycle per se, you know, the exotic animals in, in Texas, at least most of the places are still not on a real, um, a time frame. You know, they say the, um, uh, they say the axis deer, or I think they say they're, they start to breed like in July now, and they're starting to see maybe that's a trend, but, uh, I have seen babies kind of all over the place, at least with our axis deer. So, um, you know, that being said, I, I, I do think that these populations that were struggling, you know, as long as they're obviously not overhunted and, and these big game ranches certainly won't, um, they'll, they'll definitely come back uh, and come back with a vengeance. So, um, ugh, man, you know, the, these types of scenarios uh, of these kinds of storms, they, they're kind of like the hundred year floodplain, right? Uh, you, you don't expect to see anything of this nature. And again, I, I can't recall um, uh, any time where we had that that cold of temperatures. In fact, I think the the most recent, you know, Arctic blast that, that hung around for a couple of days was in uh, uh, early December of 2005. And when we had uh, Bandito, we had thunder snow. I mean, it was it was freaking nuts. And it got down pretty cold. It, it definitely got down pretty cold. But it was not this sustained cold uh, where it's three or four days uh, of sometimes the highs not even getting out of the uh, get, getting above freezing and that is what has inflicted the most damage um, on, on these herds and, and let's not forget about the native wildlife as well you know you're hearing a lot about songbirds not making it uh, white-tailed deer and turkey things of that nature have not seen any uh, substantial reports of, of, of major uh, death there. Uh, so we will, we'll, we'll kind of see how that shakes out. Again, this is still pretty, um, a, a pretty new event. So uh, again, some of the things that, that I've kind of been thinking about is, you know, well, how, how can you prevent something like this? Well, first you can't, you know, we've always said you can't play God, right? You're, you're never going to be able to dictate the weather unless you're you know storm from um uh, from x-men where her eyes will get all get all white and glassy and she forms tornadoes and that would be really cool but we can't do that so uh we've got to do what we can to prepare uh, our property whether you own it or you lease it for an event such as this um and you know we can we can obviously semi predict when these sorts of things are going to happen uh, because when do they typically happen? Well, in Texas, it seems like 
if you're going to have a major ice snow event, it's probably going to be in January and December or January and February. Now, that being said, it's, you know, it could happen in November. It can happen to December. I remember uh, you know, having a snow event in Christmas-ish, uh, but again, it seems like the big ones are going to be in, in January and February. So with that being said, you know, what, what what are you automatically doing if you're a good steward of the land, okay, and you're, you're trying to grow bigger deer or, you know, have more turkeys, okay, well, you're, you're supplemental feeding. Um, and, and I'll tell you, there, uh, at least since we've been doing this little show, there's never been a time since, again, since we've been doing this show where supplementing has be, is more important than it is right now. You know, again, definition of supplemental feeding is is it's basically being able to to feed wildlife, but it's not it's not their main it's not their main food source, but it's there for them to help antler development, or in this particular case, to keep them alive. Um, so so I I would definitely say those who were supplemental feeding, even if it's you just kept your corn feeder going after the season are, are going to fare better, not only for the game species, but for the non-game species as well. Um, so again, you know, we, we talk about the benefits of uh, uh, pro protein pellets, okay? So 20%, 16% crude protein pellets, uh, regardless of brand. Uh, we talk about cotton seed, okay, and, and, and making sure that, that that's out there. So if you had those two, you know, again, plus, hey, yeah, keep your corn fears going. What the hell? Corn's a starch. You know, it gives them a little jolt of energy, which they need when it's, you know, the wind chills and the negatives. Uh, yeah, I think your animals will definitely fare better. Um, you know, that being said, we are seeing some, uh, some reports come out of, um, you know, some of the areas in Texas that had exotics that, that really stepped up the... Uh, step up the supplemental feeding, and that's what we did at Rancho Bandito. All right, we actually we we kind of knew where these where the the black buck were going to be in the evenings. Uh, smart, they were some some of them were actually hanging up against some of our outlying barns. Uh, we saw them there kind of in the evening and early in the morning. So what did we do? Well, we went out there and we actually spread some hay. Okay, and so obviously that's going to help when they when they lay down now the wind. That's going to help their uh, their body temperature, but also. Uh, we put a lot of cotton seed out there. Again, it's got fat, it's got calories, okay, and that's what's going to to help get these animals going. So uh, again, we talk about you know January first, getting those protein feeders going. If you've got cotton seed, get that going because this is when you know, especially the white-tailed deer, right, coming out of the rut. You know, they're needing to put on some weight. Uh, they're needing to recover. And I tell you, it's speaking of, it'll be kind of interesting to see how the older white-tailed bucks fared. Uh, in, in a scenario like this, you know, especially further south where the rut happens a little bit later, you know, they're still in, they could still be in recovery mode. So, so will we see um, a bit of a, a die off in, in South Texas, um, you know, because of the storm? It, it, it remains to be seen. So again, we just cannot harp on the supplemental feeding uh, enough. And again, it not only benefits the native game, um, uh, the, the native game animals that we hunt, but also, the, again, the non-game animals, such as the songbirds, things of that nature. Uh, obviously, they are uh, very important to the, um, the overall recipe. So uh, something else that, that I've been thinking a lot of is that, again, we're seeing a lot of the reports of, of, of these die-offs happening in the hill country. Well, you know, I, I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that obviously a lot of the exotic game is in the hill country. That's kind of where it got start. But, um, you know, I, I can't help but wonder. I've seen a lot of those hill country ranches, and I'm not saying every one of them, okay? Uh, but I've definitely seen a lot of hill country ranches where they don't have any, they, their natural forage is just horrible. They're, 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 um, their range conditions are terrible. And again, that, that's got a lot to do with, you know, not only their 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 situation as far as their soil is concerned, I mean, it's very rocky out there. It's not as though they have, there's a lot of just flowing green rolling pastures. Obviously, there are some, but, you know, the hill country is kind of known for its rocks, okay? Um, and so I can't help but think because of some of the, the range conditions out there that that affected some of the animals as well. I mean, here they are. 
out there in this in this you know wind chill below zero um, you know type environment, and 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 you know they may not be used to pawing through snow because they don't get a lot of uh, snow down there per se as we do you know in central and and, and North Texas. So you know did that have an effect on them? I, I can't help but think maybe it did. So and you know so when you run into that type of scenario when the the natural forage is covered or just not there. Um, maybe even the supplemental feeding can't be enough to help them. So, uh, definitely, definitely something to, to think about, you know, if you're, uh, if you're out there, you're looking for a lease. Yeah. You want to be in the hill country because you're, you're, or, or you're buying a place. Okay. You, you want to be out there in the hill country cause you got your white tail. I mean, it's just, it's a, it's a buffet of game. It's a lot of fun, but you know, I mean, again, will this happen again? Probably when I no clue, but something to think about. Okay. You don't want to. Um, you don't want to get on a lease that's that's got to, you know more goats and sheep on there than they really need to, um, or, or or cattle where they're just grazing this thing down to nothing because um, you know not only are they they're going to eat up all the forage, but uh, it's really going to hurt your game and especially in a a situation like this. Even if you're supplemental supplemental feeding, um, I think you run the risk of of having a, a pretty bad a pretty bad year. So. Or a bad experience, rather. Uh, something else that that I think is important is, and this one is a little, you know, potentially maybe out of your power if you're a person who is leasing. But you know, wind barriers. You know, if if you look at a lot of the hill country properties again, and this is the kind of my experience has been, uh, you know, in 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 Kerr County in, in particular. I think I believe it's in Kerr County, I've, and there's been a couple of them uh, that I've actually had the the privilege of being on, but. You know, a lot of them, they have these these oak savannas where it's just nothing but oaks and some natural grass, but they also got a lot of cedar trees as well. And of course, we know that these these cedar trees are kind of the scourge of the earth, right? Um, and and they, they drink a lot of groundwater. Nothing grows below them because their canopy is so dense. Well, that kind of got me thinking, well, golly, you know, what, what a better, that couldn't be a better, you know, block against the snow. Um, and the wind, and then maybe these cedars. So I, I kind of started doing some sketching on a piece of paper, and I said to myself, you know, if, if a guy could get a compass, all right, and go out there and find true north, all right, and then go on the true south side of a big cedar tree, okay, a big one, you know, it's got the, the multi-branch that's really, you know, that takes up, um, you know, 10 by 10 yards, five by five yards, whatever it may be. And that, and that guy, that person goes on the south side of that tree and kind of almost creates a little turkey blind. You know how we talked about that, how where you get some loppers or a chainsaw and you go into that tree and you start to, to hack out pieces to where you can comfort two men, two folks can sit back there comfortably and call turkeys. I kind of thought to myself, my gosh, you know, what, what if we were to do that? You know, it, it just a, just a summer project. You do five or six trees a day. Uh, big these big these big trees. Wouldn't that be a cool deal? So what you've effectively done is again you've got the you 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 go to the truth south side of this big multi branch cedar tree. You go in there and and you kind of clean out and make basically make a little shelter. Uh, and so that when the wind does blow, okay, you've got the north side of that tree that's blocking everything. If it's snow covered. Uh, that's going to give them even more insulation. So uh, just a thought. And of course, uh, the other side is it'll be ready for turkey season when you need it. And then obviously when the big heat comes, okay, uh, you know, maybe your deer will get underneath there to get some shade during the during the middle of the day. Um, and of course, if you're if you're leasing a property, you know, something to consider is the rancher may love you for it because, you know, during the heat, where, where do the cows go? Okay, when it's really hot, where do the cows go? They'll go up underneath those cedar trees. I mean, you, you can't miss it. You can see where they've been. So it really, um, I'm actually considering trying to implement something like that on, on Rancho Bandito. Again, getting a compass, finding true north, and then going on the south side of a big multi-branch cedar tree, and then getting in there and just creating a, uh, a little condo, if you will. And um, you know, who knows if they'll ever use it, but uh, hey, it's, it's there in case they... Um, in that case, they ever really want to use it. So, uh, interesting thought. Probably overthinking it as I do with everything, but I uh, just wanted to throw that little uh, a little tip out there. Uh, something else that that I was thinking about is is just how frustrating it was that I was stuck here in Dallas and that I couldn't be at Rancho Bandito. Now, of course, my situation with 
you know, with the family and then, of course, uh, you know, friends and family that are in need, no power, busted pipes, so on and so forth, really did not afford me the ability to go out there and be at Rancho Bandito to to implement some of these things and to help and put feed out. You know, thankfully, we've got kind of a team who does that. And that's that's, you know, thanks. Hardy thanks goes out to them uh, because they're they're in the area and they can do that. But, you know, if you're in a if you're in a situation where. You know, you have the ability to get out to your property. Um, I'll, I'll tell you what, especially if you're leasing it, the rancher is going to love you. You know, as long as you've got, you know, somewhere there that you can stay, um, that, uh, that you know, that, that that's going to be okay versus this incredible, uh, incredible cold, so on and so forth, the rancher would love your help. You know, some one of the things that a lot of people don't think about during these big Arctic blasts is the uh, the water? I mean, water is an absolute essential um, is essential element in, in any animal's survival. So without it, they're going to die. And I don't care if it's 115 or, or negative five with the wind chill. They've got to have water. Uh, and so you know, you see a lot of the stuff on the news and, and all the social media crap. Uh, about these ranchers out there with axes breaking up stock tanks, okay? Well, you know, it shows the cattle around there because they're absolutely thirsty as hell. Well, don't forget your wildlife need that too. Um, and, and so, you know, if you've got the ability, uh, and again, it's, it's, it's you know, it, it's kind of dicey, you know, whether you leave your house, again, if you have somebody capable that can help uh, your loved ones there, you know, get out to your property, help that rancher. You never know. You know, you, you might be able to score a, a discount because you were out there with that landowner, you know, working the property, um, you know, you're potentially saving, you know, his stock's life. And, of course, you're going to benefit in the wildlife as well. So, again, probably easier said than done, but just, just something to think about. Um, and then, truthfully, also, if you're out there, at least you can say, well, I put my best foot forward, you know, that that I did everything I could to try to try to help my animals. So, Again, um, boy, what what a crazy event! Uh, you know, the, obviously the the kids here in the the city love the snow. Uh, parents hate it, of course, well because the kids were out of school, right? And then all the the potential damage, but um, it really remains still yet to be seen what's going to happen with this whole scenario. What the the ultimate effect is going to be? Um, yeah, we could always use the moisture, but but obviously this way has been has been very difficult. So uh, again, I think the conclusion from this entire event, something that we just we we can't stress enough, and we've been saying it um, for years, is you know you supplemental feeding. It is absolutely key, and I think you can. I think we can all say that supplemental feeding has probably helped a lot of animals out this past week and potentially kept them alive. Um, you know, I would also say that range conditions, you've got to watch your range conditions, you know, in these types of scenarios, you know, the storm popped up on everybody's radar, you know, a week and a half ago, everybody's looking at the weather and then they're using the old Texas weather saying, well, you don't like the weather in Texas, just wait 30 minutes and it'll change. Well, in this case it did change, but it got worse. Um, and so at that point, there's nothing you can do about poor range conditions. It's not as though you can go pull cattle off a pasture or goats and sheep off a pasture. And hopefully, you know, your, your restoration of that pasture will begin. I mean, it's, it's too late. So you've got to, again, if you're an owner, you got to think about those things, the balance between your livestock and your wildlife and, and what's more important to you. And I understand that sometimes, you know, if you just, if you, if you've got a place and you've got to have cattle, I totally understand that. But for these types of events uh, that, that potentially could happen, you know, you know, starting in January, maybe you throw a couple extra bales of hay out there. Yeah, sure. It's expensive, but it'll give your pasture a break. Um, again, range conditions. I think if we have better range conditions in the state, uh, this particular event wouldn't have been uh, as bad. So uh, anyway, again, thoughts and prayers and for everybody who's been affected by the storm. Um, if you've got a story about your place, whether it's your lease or your land, uh, let us know. We'll talk about it on the air because, again, this is this is developing news. It is still happening. And we are, um, we're, we're just, we're, we're interested to see how everybody fared. Uh, hopefully they, they, they did well. Also give a big shout out to all those feed stores, not only in Texas, but really kind of around these affected areas. 
Uh, it, it amazes me, you know, looking at the social media and all these feed stores in Texas, um, like like Clifton Feed and Service, you know, th those folks, um, you know, they they risk their own life and own safety to get out there and to open up their store to help people. OK, that's, you know, it, it, at, at that point, it's not about money. It's never been money for these about money for these small town feed stores. OK, uh, it's about helping out your fellow man, helping your fellow Texan. And, and again, uh, that's been exemplified with this whole event. Uh, it's just been really great to see that, you know, a lot of these feed store owners and probably even employees have, have risked their their safety to come in and open up so that that farmer can get the, or that rancher can get some hay or can get some supplemental feed, whatever it is. So uh, again, hats off to them. That is what makes um, really this, this lifestyle, the ran farming and ranching lifestyle so special. Um, you know, I, I highly doubt you would see, and not saying it, it doesn't happen everywhere, but I, I don't think you see that a lot in the big city. So uh, anyways, that is all I have got for you today. Hope everybody is doing well, and we will see you next time on the Feed Bandit Podcast. Thanks for listening to the Feed Bandit Podcast. If you like what we discuss on the show, be sure to sign up to our email list to get even more killer hunting ideas, tips, tricks, and exclusive deals on innovative hunting gear and services delivered straight to your inbox. Sign up over at FeedBandit.com or simply by texting the word BANDIT to 33777. See you on the next one, and remember, support your local feed store.